Welcome back. In this video, I'm going to attempt to integrate the keyboard into the hack computer that was built on prior videos. Uh, the goal is to be able to run the Pong application presented in Chapter 6 of the Elements of Computing Systems. Uh, what you're seeing here is a mapping that I'm doing of the ASCII codes to the scan codes for the unshifted, shifted, and extended ROMs of the keyboard component. If you'd like to obtain a copy of the ROM files themselves so that you don't have to do this yourself, uh, you can go to Odyssey. I've got the link in the comments in the description and support my videos. Join a, a membership, even if only for a month, and then you can obtain these ROM files without you doing this, uh, this work yourself. Next, I synthesize the KBD test circuit that I built in the last video. You can see the link in the card up at the top. And then I spot checked a bunch of keys to see that the ASCII codes uh, seem reasonable. And off camera, I actually checked every key to make sure that uh, the mappings are as I expected. Well, here's our system on chip of the hack computer that was done a few videos ago, and uh, you'll see, you can link to the video up on the card up on the top, put that out there for you, and also in the comments. What we want to do is add the keyboard. In order to do that, we, we, there's, a, there's a couple of things first we have to do. Um, the big thing is the memory router, so we need to be able to, when the CPU tries to ask for the address of the keyboard, um, to be able to take that address and then give back any value that may be uh, sitting in the keyboard component. So the way we're going to do that is uh, we're going to take a copy of the VRAM access control component. And we'll create ourselves a, uh, I guess, a keyboard access control. And we'll rename this to KBD. The question is, what address is the keyboard? Does the CPU address the keyboard at? And the answer is on page 92 of the Elements of Computing Systems. It says it's decimal 24576. That's the address right after the 8K screen memory map. So what is that represented in binary? Well, I just happen to have the calculator here. And it's 0, 1, 1, and then the rest zeros. So if we do this, so let's see, so 0, right, so 0, 1, 1. However, we need the rest of these to be 0 as well, so... If we make this a, what, a 16-bit? And the last one needs to be a zero. And, well, I tell you what, let's get rid of all of these. And can we wire these across? No, we can't, unfortunately. And in fact, let me get rid of that. Okay, so zero, one, one, and then all zeros will need to be something like this. So that's zero, because it's negated, and then one, one, don't negate those, and then the rest of these all have to be negated. Okay, so that should present us with true when the address, the input address, is for the keyboard. So let's go back to the system on chip, and now we want to go to the memory router, and... Um, we'll want to take the input for the keyboard, uh, of course, the address from the CPU, 
And then we'll add in the component that we just created into the memory router. All right, so we need a keyboard access control. We need this one. So we'll connect the keyboard access control in address to the input address. And then we need to multiplex this uh, up to the MUX. And so the way, so, so we're going to need more inputs to the MUX. So first of all, let's disconnect this. And then for our MUX, we will want two select bits. And of course, we'll need to actually let me undo this and then remove these so I don't get confused. Now we'll change this. So now we'll put these back where I had them. So uh, program RAM will be accessed at zero and volatile ram will be accessed at one where it was but what we'll do is we'll create a splitter Such that with bit zero, if bit zero is on, that'll mean that's uh, the number one. And which means if we get a VRAM access control coming through, uh, we'll want one to mean, to mean VRAM. Um, so let's see if I can do this without crossing. Eh, I guess I can't. Uh, that's okay. We'll just do it this way. It's a little ugly. That's okay. Okay, on the other hand, if the keyboard access control is true, then we'll want to route that to this one bit, which means this will be the two, the, the number two, and um, then we'll want to take the input from the keyboard and pass it through, which we'll need to create another input for. All right, I think that uh, that should do it. So now back to our system on chip, and I'm sure my inputs and outputs for that memory router are all going to be messed up. Yep, just like I thought. That's okay. We'll fix it up. Okay, so finally, we need our keyboard input. So we want to merge the keyboard project into this project. And then down below, we should have all of the nice keyboard components. Now, this one's our test. Uh, we don't really need this one in here, but we do want to create one that represents the keyboard as it will be inserted into this project. But let me go ahead and remove this circuit. We don't need it. Right, so, so here's our keyboard. Now, uh, the only problem with this keyboard component as it sits here is that the input clock is synchronized based upon the keyboard's input, which is in no way related to the system clock at all. In fact, from the system's clock's, system clock's perspective, this clock looks asynchronous because it comes in very unpredictably. And so there is a thing called metastability that we have to concern ourselves with. Our uh, hack CPU Uh, runs at a frequency of 12 megahertz. And 
and our keyboard. Um, PS2 design. We go to this uh, specification that I found online. It's the keyboard auxiliary device controller specification all the way back to 1991. Uh, talks about the PS2 keyboard rate. I'm going to zoom this up. And it, and it says that the clock duration for inactive and active, which is T3 and 4, up here in this diagram. So one complete clock cycle takes uh, a total of 100 microseconds, right? So 100 microseconds is equal to a frequency of 10 kilohertz. So as you can see, we've got a discrepancy between the clock that the keyboard is going to present to the FPGA and the clock that the FPGA is ticking around at in order to run the CPU. Uh, so there's basically two clock domains in play here. And more than that, this clock right here to the FPGA is going to actually look like an asynchronous input because, you know, if you'll recall, you don't get a continuous clock on the keyboard. You only get clocked input whenever there's actually something to be input in the first place. Otherwise, the clock stays high. So there's this concept called metastability. And it's actually a terrible word. I, I The word always, when I hear it, doesn't imply to me that it's something undesirable. Um, but in fact, it, it, it is undesirable in FPGA design because of what it really means is uh, there are periods of time where internal synchronous components can be in an, an unstable state, meaning they are neither high nor low and don't know which state to transition into. So to try to understand how to keep components out of a metastable state, uh, let's, let's look at one tick of a clock. So let's assume that we've got our hack CPU clock. And let's assume that we divide this clock sort of in half like this, uh, if I can draw this correctly. So in order for, let's say, a flip-flop, when you, when you put the input into the flip-flop and you tick the clock, in order for your input to be registered correctly on the output, uh, there's a set. There's something called a setup time and a hold time. So let's talk about setup time. Right. So from this point in time and to this point in time, your input needs to be held at a constant level in order for the setup time constraint to be valid. And then likewise, there's a some period of time after the clock from here to here, called hold time, where again, your input has to be maintained in order for this clock tick and the uh, sequential device to be able to pick up on the fact that this is the correct state for that tick of the clock. Okay, so that all seems fine, but how does that apply? to our, our keyboard input. Well, 
keyboard design puts out two outputs. It puts out a 8-bit value ASCII code, which represents what you've typed on the keyboard. And it outputs a valid flag to indicate whether or not the output that's sitting on the keyboard is valid output or not. Because, you know, you have 11 bits, you know, every scan code is 11 bits. And every scan code is taking 100 microseconds. Uh, and in total, it's taking 1.1 1 .1 milliseconds for valid output. Right? Because if each if each bit is 100 microseconds, you have 11 bits, so that's a total of 1.1 milliseconds in order to get valid output. Well, more than that, this valid output can occur at any point in time relative to the hack CPU clock, because again, they're not tied together in any way. The keyboard will basically clock stuff out at the rate based upon when you push the key in the first place. So what that really means is that our valid signal can in theory occur any time here. So if the valids, let's, let's assume that this is our valid symbol. So I'm gonna to try to draw this in a way that tries to make sense here. So, so let's say our valid signal valid number one. So let's say our valid signal behaves like this. Well, since it's changing state outside of the setup and hold time parameter windows, then our hack CPU is happy. If we were to feed this into a flip-flop into the hack CPU, everything would be fine, right? So this, this is okay. This, this valid signal is valid from the perspective of the CPU being able to t take it and inject it into its own sequential logic paths. But let's assume for a minute then that the valid signal changes somewhere like this. Right, so if it were to change states into this band of setup time requirements of the of the hack CPU's clock, this is a setup violation. And what you're gonna wind up with is a flip-flop within the hack CPU that will not be representative of the correct state of what this valid number two is. Now, frankly, I'm not sure what it's going to do, uh, but it's definitely not going to be predictable. And likewise, if you have another violation, it looks something like this. That's a hold violation. And again, we don't know what the CPU is going to do with that information, right? So. The bottom line here is that there has to be some way that we can deal with uh, what is essentially two different clocks. They exist in different clock domains, and more importantly, this is an asynchronous clock, if that's sort of oxymoronic. Um, this is, from, from this, from the hack CPU's perspective, it doesn't even know when this clock is going off. So what can we do to solve this problem? So let's create our hack keyboard to deal with uh, metastable issues. So let's just call this hack KBD. And of course, we'll need a keyboard. So let's pull in our keyboard component we just imported. And we'll need to pass these inputs in, obviously. The purpose of this component is to be able to sync the keyboard, valid keyboard data, up to the system clock. So, obviously, we need the system clock to be input as well. 
Okay, so one way to synchronize uh, input coming from the keyboard is to buffer um, this valid signal through a series of flip-flops. And so the question is, well, how many flip-flops? And there's a calculation you can do to figure it out, but I'm going to just take a guess and assume that a couple of flip-flops will probably do. So we're just going to go with that for now. So let me... Put some flip-flops down here. And I'll reference uh, some documentation on various techniques that you can use to deal with metastable problems. Um, this, this one technique is, is documented in there. And so they explain this technique probably better than I can. So check in the comments. Ultimately, what we're going to want to have happen here is we're going to want to put the value of ASCII out uh, into a flip-flop as well. Because what we want to do is when these become valid, then we're going to want to basically store this off in a flip-flop. And if these are not valid, what we want is to just route whatever is in the flip-flop back into its input. Um, so that it, you know, retains whatever it was the last clock tick. And to that register, we are going to take the output of a MUX. And what we want to have happen is we want to have this valid indicator be true Basically, now, obviously, it needs to be valid now. It needs to be valid one clock tick into the past and then another clock tick into the past. So what we'll do is we'll hook up a uh, AND gate. And it'll need three inputs. And so, if this select is a 1, that means this one will be the one chosen, which means that we want to take the value from our keyboard, and we want to route that to this flip-flop. Now, we'll, we need to deal with these signals here in a minute. We'll do that. Otherwise, if it's 0, what do we want? Well, we want to loop back. the value from the register back into the MUX to basically just keep the value that we have here. And then, of course, our output for this whole component is going to be the output of this register. So let's put a pin here to represent that. And then our write enable, we're just going to set that to true all the time because basically we're either going to be writing the value from the flip from the register or we're going to be writing the value from the keyboard component here. So no matter what happens, that will always be write enabled. So we'll never clear the we'll never clear the flip flop, and then obviously we need the clock. Clocking the register. This forms a circuit in order to ensure that we do not get into a metastable condition with our keyboard. So let's now insert this component into our system on chip.
So we are going to need some input pins. And that'll be coming in from the keyboard. And then clock, this is the system clock, which is here. And then this output here will be routed to the input here. However, uh, I believe these are expecting 16-bit words. This is only 8-bit because it's ASCII, so we're going to need to fix this up a little bit to make this a 16-bit word. So what we'll do is we'll create a splitter. And there we have it. Let's test it. So I'm going to start with the keyboard test circuit and I'm first going to remove the LEDs and associated components. Then I'm going to take uh, my VGA adapter and you can see uh, the linked video uh, on how I have done this in the past, but I'm going to wire up all the ground pins first and then I'm going to add in a voltage divider resistor for each RGB input and then wire up the inputs through the voltage divider. And finally, I'm going to add in impedance matching resistors for the horizontal and vertical sinks. So I've updated the program ROM with the Pong game and I've connected the monitor and the keyboard and I've then run the synthesizer for the what is now the hack computer. And I expect to see a Pong game start, and I see nothing. One of the reasons for me uh, taking a while to get this video out is I went through a, a long diagnostic process trying to figure out exactly what this problem was. Um, you know, I checked the hardware by loading some of the old circuits that I had from prior videos to just make sure that I hadn't messed that up. Um, I also put in small programs just to exercise the CPU, and I could get those to execute fine. Um, so it was, really, it was a real mystery to me is why this longer program wouldn't work. Uh, one of the things that I did notice is that synthesis was taking a very, very long time to execute. I mean, really long, way longer than it seemed like it should have. One of the things that I when looked at out of the synthesis uh, when we're talking about Vivado is it spits out a tight timing report. And I, I combed through that report and what it seemed to suggest was uh, I was um, doing things regarding resetting counters that required tight timing. And upon looking back at uh, all of the circuits in the hack CPU and video and so forth, I noticed that indeed for all the timers or all of the counters, I was utilizing the asynchronous reset of the counters. And I suppose there is a good reason why you want you might want to do that, but um, in in my particular use case for here, there really wasn't a good reason. Um, so what you see here is first the video RAM access driver where I'm converting it, um, converting the, the reset on the counter to from an asynchronous reset to a synchronous reset. And so what that means is I need the last horizontal pixel, which is um, h tote minus one, and I need the last vertical line, which is v tote minus one. And at the point where my counters, my horizontal count, my vertical count, equal to each one of those, then on the next clock tick, I want to reset the uh, RAM counter to zero. So that's the effort that's going on here is um, to, um, to, 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 to do that reset once um, we've reached the last pixel and the last line. I'm 
So the last thing to do is to just tell the counter what you want it to reset to, which probably would reset to zero if you didn't anyway, but I'm going to be thorough and just make sure that I put the constant, uh, associate the constant to the counter for what it's going to reset itself to. All right, so that takes care of that one. The, the next one is the sync pulse generator. Now, the sync pulse generator, you know, you'll notice there are several uh, counters involved here. And uh, just fair warning, this is going to be a fairly lengthy one because while the change itself is not particularly hard, you know, you have, um, you know, row counters and line counters, and you have to make sure you do this right. Um, and of course, I did not, and there were, I'm, 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 Going, going to have to be going through several debugging exercises uh, to basically try to make this all correct. So the first thing is um, dealing with uh, computing the uh, constants that I need to interrogate. Uh, you know, because again, when you get to the end and you're doing this synchronously, you need you know counters minus one because. The next, the next one that you get, that's when it essentially wraps around. And get a little too obsessive compulsive with drawing lines, so apologize for that. And you know, normally when I'm doing these videos, I sort of do this extemporaneously as I you know I, I try to provide the commentary as I'm doing it so that it it's uh, sort of reflective of my thought process and so forth. But um, you know, when I was doing this work, I was actually thinking I had it done and then I would synthesize and I would test and it still wouldn't work. And I was going back and forth. And basically, I just decided to focus on the work and uh, decided to come back and uh, voice over uh, this work so that I could concentrate on actually trying to solve the problem. So this doesn't sound like what I would normally do in my prior videos, uh, well, you know the reason. I'm, you know, sort of watching this back and trying to provide some rational commentary. So now I have uh, computed h toad minus 1 and v toad minus 1. So and now it's time to integrate those into, uh, first of all, the uh, horizontal counter reset. So we want to reset the horizontal counter to zero, obviously. And then we're going to remove the reset, the asynchronous reset. And then we want our horizontal counter compared not to h tote, but to h tote minus one. Because again, it's going to be on the next tick where we want this counter to be reset to zero. So when that's equal, now we want to do the reset.
Now, for some reason, I'm also thinking that I have to take the H pix sync and the V V pitch V pix sync constants uh, and compute the minus one variance of those as well. Um, you know, these are not involved in resetting anything. And so I'm not sure why when I was doing this that I thought I needed to do that. Um, but in any case, that's what I wound up doing. And I left it in here because I didn't want you to, I didn't want to cut it out. And then later you see it reappear, uh, at the end to confuse you. So, um, you know, bear with me as I sort of go through setting these up because eventually I do realize that they really were not necessary. And in fact, you'll actually see when I do some simulation testing, um, you know, you'll, I'll point out where the, um, the sync signals are not the right polarity. And, and basically they're not, they're not doing what they're supposed to do because, uh, I basically screw this up by changing this H pick sync to, uh, H pick sync minus one. Yeah, so you may be able to see as I'm as I'm in the process of screwing this up. You now, really, the case is that uh, once horizontal, if, so long as horizontal count is less than the horizontal um, pixel sync, then we want uh, the H sync signal to, uh, to to reflect that. And of course, again, the um, H sync pause determines whether we've got a positive going signal or a negative going signal for horizontal sync. And likewise, I go, I'm going through the same incorrect exercise for the uh, vertical pixel sync. So here we go. You know, I like to show my foibles as well. Um, you know, stuff's not typically easy, and, you know, any YouTuber can just hack everything together to make it look like everything is so successful and they're so smart, but uh, it's not the way it works out, at least not for me anyway. So now, um, you know, that circuitry is not needed anymore, and um, in its place, I need to know when the, you know, when I need to increment the line. And so uh, that can be determined uh, whenever we get to the end of the line and that's what i'm attempting to do here of course i also managed to mess this up <laughs> uh we'll find out you know I'll, I'll let you know once we get there uh as to why this actually this doesn't work precisely like it's supposed to but in any case uh once we get to the 
once we get to the end of the line, then uh, that's when we want to enable counting the, the, the vertical line. So now I'm also dealing with the asynchronous reset, getting rid of that. Of course, putting in the constant zero to reset it. Again, getting some positioning OCD. And finally, when V count is equal to V tote minus one, and if you're looking carefully, you can see that I did not change V tote to V tote minus one on that little reset circuit. But in any case, um, again, lots of bugs to fix. Um, so when v, v count is equal to V, v tote minus one, then we use the synchronous uh, reset as opposed to the asynchronous. All right, so now I start going through a little simulation exercise because I know in the back of my mind I probably screwed something up. That you can't do that many changes and get it right the first time. So I change, I'm changing all of the um, binary indicators to decimal so that I don't have to translate binary so much. Doesn't really make a difference for the circuit. Just makes it easier for me to see from a simulation perspective. And always remember, if you're going to simulate, you got to hit the little simulate icon up there. I forget to do that oftentimes, and I get confused as to why I can't. You know, it, it changes the behavior of the user interface when you enter into simulation mode. You know, you can set constants like I'm doing now. If you're um, in the in the pointer mode, or the, the I guess the design mode, then you can't do this. And, you know, I, I wind up going down to the property tab, trying to change the constants, and it, you know, Obviously that you can't you can't do that there. And when you step through in simulation mode and you don't have a, an obvious clock, it asks you which pin the clock's supposed to be, and obviously CLK is that pin. So I start trucking along, clicking single steps. I'm watching the horizontal counter when it ticks over to 10 then that's when the line should increment, and that's what it's doing. So, so far, it seems to be working fine. You know why I suddenly decided to stop and redo it is anybody's guess. <laughs> this was done a while ago. Uh, and you'll, you will notice that when you, when you reset the simulation, it clears out all your constants, which is kind of annoying.
Now I'm heading where I'm heading with this is uh, I'm trying to get the veto to five. Now, as soon as this clicks over, this should reset the ver the vertical counter, and it did not do it at the right time. And I finally realize, oh, I missed putting veto minus one. Okay, so I'm going to reset it, put my constants back in. And we're going to start the simulation over again. <laughs> So we got the first line. You notice the VSync signal is actually wrong um, at the moment, but that's okay. That's not what I'm really in this test. That's not what I was looking at. Okay, so it got to four, and then once it got to nine, the next tick around, uh, it did reset correctly. I, I kind of blew through it really fast, but uh, it, it, did, it did work correctly. Actually, now that I'm, as I'm watching this again, what I, what I realize is that it actually did not work correctly. And what happened was, is that it didn't cycle through all of the pixels for the last line. And that's what I'm puzzling over right now. I, uh, I realized that it, it got to the last line, but it didn't cycle through all the pixels on the last line. And so I'm scratching my head going, why is, why did it behave that way? We'll soon find out. I've, 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 oh, yeah, here it is right here. Bang, it didn't go through all the pixels in the last line. So I think the first time I did it, I was like, wait, did, did I just miss that? <laughs> so I reset it again. And I finally realized what the problem is. And the way I solved the problem to get through all the pixels in the last line is that I only want to reset the vertical counter when the line increment flag is true and when we are at the end of the line.
or at the last line, I should say. So now one more time, I go run through this simulation. Or, actually I lied, it's not the last time because I still have this the horizontal and vertical sync problem that I, I discover, but that's going to be in a second here. Okay, so I'm walking through this reset logic one more time, and what I'm looking for is to see that the last line, which is line 4, all the pixels for that last line come through. Yeah, so see now I'm on the fourth line, and I'm ticking through to make sure that I can tick through all those pixels. And they were on the ninth one, and then, okay, and it rolls over. So, now, that reset logic is working correctly. And I'm either doing it again to make sure I believe my fix worked. And now I realize, wait a minute. The horizontal sync and the vertical sync are not working correctly. And I realized, ah, you dummy. This was not this was not needed. This this worked fine. These are not resetting anything. So I go ahead and put these back where they were. And uh, the HPix sync minus one and VPix sync minus one uh, little computations down there on the bottom right aren't really necessary anymore, although I don't think I delete them, but um, they can be deleted, just taking up extra uh, circuitry on the FPGA. And I did run through that test again, although I cut it out, unfortunately. Probably should have left it in, but uh, this video is getting long as it is. Uh, the last circuit that required change was the pixel generator. So the pixel generator um, had an extra tick at the end where it was needlessly doing an asynchronous reset. And all that I really needed to do... Uh, was count up to 15 and essentially just roll over to zero. Uh, so I'm basically resetting the size, the, the width, to four bits, which counts me up to 15. Finally, I resynthesize, and oh, look at that, it works. Thanks for watching.